All right. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Conservation Conversations. It's Friday, June 19th, and I am Ana Sangronis, Florida Sea Grant Extension Agent. This webinar series is a joint effort between UF IFAS Extension, Florida Sea Grant, and Miami-Dade County Eco Adventures. We will be offering this webinar series through the end of June on Fridays at 1 and 5 p.m. While we can't see you in person right now, we are really happy to offer this series and connect with you despite all that's going on around us. Thank you for tuning in today. Everyone in this webinar is currently muted, so I ask that you type any questions into the chat box, which I will be moderating. We'll be taking questions at the end of the session. The webinar is being recorded and a link to the recording will be sent out within the next week. Please follow us on social media where we will be announcing the conversation topic at the beginning of each week. If instead you'd like to receive an email reminder with the weekly topic and registration links, please let me know or indicate in the chat box that this is what you would like. Now I'm going to turn it over to today's presenter, Crystal Espinosa of Miami-Dade County Eco Adventures. So hi everyone, good afternoon. Thank you for tuning in. So today's topic is on sand dunes of South Florida. So this is me, I work with Miami Eco Adventures and I am an interpreted program leader based out of Crandon Park um, in Key Biscayne, Florida. Before we get started, I'm gonna go ahead and play this short video just to kind of get you guys in the scene of what we're gonna be talking about. While most people rush through the trails or the boardwalk to head to the beach, I believe the journey there is probably my favorite part. Um, you can see there's so much greenery and stillness and walking under the canopy of those large sea grape trees, I think is a really special moment before you're even right out to the ocean. And so while most people may not think anything of this short walk to the beach, you're actually walking right past our sand dune habitat, which is going to be what we're discussing today. An overview of what we're going to be going over, uh, what are sand dunes, their benefits, their composition and adaptations, some threats they may face, protection and restoration, and how you can help. What are sand dunes? Sand dunes are a feature found along our coastlines. They are formed from the accumulation of really fine sediment that's transported up the beach by either wind or waves. The accumulation of the sand will begin to recruit vegetation and that's what's actually gonna go ahead and help to build up an actual dune. Some benefits that sand dunes provide us one of them being it helps prevent erosion. So sand dunes are pretty much adjacent to beaches, and so they help trap in that sediment. Without a sand dune, it's very easy for storms or just normal wave action to kind of take the beach away. And so the sand dunes really help solidify and keep our beaches in place. The Florida Department of Environmental Protect Protection states that Florida receives $15 billion each year from tourism. So again, a lot of people come to Florida to come to our beaches. It's, it's really nice. And so we have sand dunes to help in thinking for that. They also help protect us and act as a buffer during storm surges. And they provide habitat for various flora and fauna, some of which are protected. Before we go ahead and continue, I'm gonna go ahead and launch a poll question. It's okay if you don't know the answer, we'll go over it. So what is the height of the tallest sand dune in Florida? So we'll wait a couple more seconds. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and close the poll. Okay, so most people answered 25 feet. 
So this is actually the tallest sand dune in Florida. It's nicknamed Nana. And this sand dune is found in Amelia Island in the northeast coast of Florida. This sand dune is a height of 65 feet, which is pretty crazy. Um, a lot of Florida, you know, especially here in South Florida, we're pretty much at sea level or a couple of feet above that. And so this sand dune's pretty tall in um, comparison. So sand dunes specific to Florida. The extensiveness of dunes depends on the amount of wave and wind forces that are present. So these three pictures are representing the east coast of Florida, the west coast, and the panhandle. And I've gone ahead and looked into different Florida state parks um, that are islands to kind of help in comparing. So on the left hand side is Bilbag State Florida Park. This is in Miami-Dade County. And in the southeast coast, we have a lot higher wave and wind action, and so our dunes are more extensive. So you can see with this arrow that the width of the dune here is pretty wide. For the Gulf Coast um, or the west coast of Florida, I, the middle picture is of Lover Keys State Park by Fort Myers. The Gulf Coast has a lot lower wave and wind action, and so the dunes are more limited as seen with the red arrow. It's a lot less wide. The final picture on the right hand side is of Topsail Hill State Park located in the Panhandle. The Panhandle receives moderately high levels of wave and wind and so the dunes can be pretty extensive which you could see with the red arrow. So again depending where you are in Florida you're going to see some variation in the extensiveness of sand dunes on the beach. A typical dune has several different zones and we're gonna be going into each one. So starting closest to the water's edge and going more inland, we have the Pioneer Dune, then the Four Dune, Dune Field, Scrub, and then Hammock. So we're gonna go a little bit more into each one. This is actually a picture I took, um, a panoramic shot at Crandon Park. And this picture helps show three out of the five zones pretty easily. With that arrow, you can see the four dune, which is closest to that lifeguard stand and just the water beyond that. The dune field zone is this grassy area in the middle. And then all the way left, which is heading more inland, you could see the beginning of the scrub zone. The pioneer dune zone, as I mentioned, is the first portion of the dune and it begins above the shore's high tide line, where really fine sediment will start to accumulate. Because this portion is pretty much the front facing area of the beach, the plants that grow here need to have a lot of adaptations to withstand these harsh conditions. Usually the vegetation found here is really low line, and the adaptations they need to have in order to survive living in this area is being salt tolerant, heat tolerant, drought tolerant and being able to survive and thrive in more of like a sandy soil. It's pretty much uh, sand right on the beach. These pictures are um, of two vegetation that's common to this pioneer dune zone area. We have sea rocket on the left and on the right is the burrowing four o'clock, which is an endangered species of vegetation found in Southeast Florida. The next zone is the four dune zone. So just after the pioneer zone, this zone um, will recruit tougher plants that have more extensive root systems and that's what's really gonna help stabilize the dune. Because this area is a lot more inland, there's higher levels of nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus. So the first plant you can see here on the top left is the coastal sand burr. If you've ever walked on the beach and you see those little spiky balls that are like stuck on your shoes, might even be on your skin, they really hurt. It's this plant, that's how they um, help spread their seeds. So the coastal sand burr. The bottom left is beach sunflower. The top right we have sea oats. This is probably the poster child you think of when you think of a dune. These are actually protected in Florida under statue 161 
Um, so it's actually illegal to take seals off the beach because they are protecting our beaches from erosion. And the bottom right is beach croton. The third zone is dune field zone. This is pretty much a collection of four dunes that are a lot older and really well stabilized um, in the area. You can see it looks almost like a, like a meadow or a grassy area, and it's just like a sea of sea oats. You can also see that it's adding a lot of width. And so this dune field zone is overall the area that's gonna really take the brunt of storm surges, and it's gonna help absorb a lot of energy to help protect more inland areas. The last two zones are the scrub and hammock zone. And so as we move more inland, the vegetation will become less salt and wind tolerant. Also being more inland, there's more organic material and nutrients that are available to allow more woody plants to thrive. So the scrub zone, you can see um, a pretty common plant is the sea grape tree, which is a pretty big, it could get upwards of 30 feet tall. Um, the, sea, the sea grape is also protected under that same Florida statue as the sea oats. And as you move more inland, uh, you'll see more woodier vegetation and a common one is the picture on the right, which is live oak. Some sand dune wildlife. Um, we have the marsh rabbit, which you can see on the bottom right. We also have raccoons that will use the area for hunting. Sea turtles are also um, pretty common sight. Sea turtle mothers, we are in sea turtle season right now, could potentially lay their nests either near or inside of sand dunes. And you can see on the top right, um, a loggerhead sea turtle nest that has been marked off. And we also have gopher tortoises, which are a threatened species of land turtle, and they can actually create uh, their burrowing holes inside of sand dunes. So some threats that, um, Sorry, some threats that they face include coastal development, foot and vehicle traffic, marine debris, sea level rise, and non-native vegetation. So on the picture on the top right, I actually took this photo a couple weeks ago. You could see on the left, there's a sea turtle um, nest. And just to the right of it, there is a pretty large balloon. And so marine debris is a whole other issue we face um, by itself on a beach, but in there being a lot of marine debris washed ashore or left on the beach, there is a higher chance that that debris is then going to make its way into our sand dune ecosystems and negatively impact the wildlife there. The picture on the bottom right is referring to the non-native vegetation. So that plant that you see that's pretty tall is Australian pine, which is an invasive species to Florida. These trees can grow pretty rapidly along our shorelines. The pine needles that they have will actually scatter on the floor. And you can see they're pretty tall, so they're creating a lot of shade, um, which prevents our native sand dune vegetation from growing. So this is negatively impacting um, the opportunity for our native plants to thrive there. So we're gonna go into coastal development as a threat. According to NOAA, Florida's total population of 19.6 million people, 15 million of those people live in coastal portions of the state. So we like being near the water. But increased development near the coast can weaken the protection that natural sand dunes provide. This picture is of Miami Beach, um, which does have a lot of nourishment projects you can see that this coastline is very urbanized. Um, on the top portion of the picture, more north, you can see that Miami Beach could pretty much disappear without these nourishment projects. The beach is not very wide there at all. Um, but these nourishment projects are needed in order to keep widening the beach that, does, that is susceptible to erosion over time. And so these nourishment projects are really costly um, and there is maintenance needed to keep um, adding more and more sand to pretty much make sure that this urbanized shoreline doesn't erode away. 
This picture that you're seeing is from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, and this was actually a nourishment project that was completed in 2017 before Hurricane Irma. And this beach widening project was $11.5 million. So again, this wasn't just one a one and done project. This is going to need uh, this is going to need maintenance over time. So again, it's a very costly um, thing to do. Another threat to sand dunes is sea level rise. So this infographic shows areas in Florida, the highlighted in blue portions, that are already at or below sea level, and what they would look like with a five foot sea level rise. So you can see South Florida, pretty much most of it is in that blue highlighted area. Um, so higher sea levels will result in the possible diminishing of beaches. And if there's not that many uh, beaches left, then the dunes are gonna have a lot less sediment kind of being pumped their way in order to be more extensive sand dune systems. So based off this graphic and with sea level rising, we can anticipate that with increasing sea level rise, there will probably be a lessening of our dunes and their extensiveness here in South Florida. So restoration and protection. Sand dunes that have been damaged by storm surges or human impacts, they can be restored. So the use of root extensive vegetation like sea oats can help rebuild sand dunes by trapping any remaining sand pile that's left. The picture on the left is um, actually a sand dune that was um, partially eroded away from Hurricane Irma. And you can see it's almost a cross section of the dune and it helps to see how extensive those root systems we were talking about are. So this plant is really good again in stabilizing the sand dunes. And the picture on the right shows sand fences, which can also be used to help trap sediment. However, this is not really a common site in South Florida because it does play a conflict um, with our high density of sea turtle nests and the mothers that come out in, from the water. So we won't see those too much. We'll see more um, restoration and planting more vegetation. So this is a picture of the sea oat restoration project that we had at Crandon Park in January of 2018. So this was after Hurricane Irma. You can see our sand dunes like look like really sad little blank uh, piles of sand. The picture on the left is of some of the baby sea oats that we had um, for our restoration project. We were able to receive around 3,000 baby sea oats to replant. Um, we did spread them out a bit of a distance and you can see the picture on the right, um, the little tufts of hair almost coming out after we planted them. So we're gonna do a quick poll question before we continue. At what depth do sea turtles need to, sorry. <laughs> At what depth do sea oats need to be planted under the sand um, for the best chance of establishing roots? So give your best guess. So how many inches under do they need to be buried for their roots to be well established? Perfect. So before we answer that question, um, again, this is another photo from the same restoration project. On the left, you can see some of our volunteers planting the seaward side of the, the sand dune that was just pretty much blank sand. And you can see after all those little bits of baby sea oats popping out. So these small sea oats need to be planted at least six inches under the sand for the best chance of establishing roots. So if you're thinking about, if you've ever planted um, plants in your garden, you usually just need the roots to be under the ground and you're good to go. But with sea oats, you practically want to bury them. So they're, so they're able to be near the bottom of the sand dune and again be able to give the best chance possible for those roots to start spreading out and establishing then all that sand that's already been lost. So how are some ways that you can help protect sand dunes? 
So the picture on the left you can see, number one would probably be just avoiding stepping in these dunes. They're really, really fragile areas. A lot of foot traffic or off-road vehicles can really damage a sand dune that's taken so many years to be well established. Um, so again, just making sure you're staying off of them. Just by stepping over them repeatedly, you're moving that sand around or maybe damaging the vegetation. And then suddenly it's not able to hold in the amount of sediment it could before. Also minimizing your use of single use plastics and making sure you clean up after yourself on the beach. This photo I actually took of this week. Um, you can see that there is a balloon entangled in a sea turtle nest and the sand dune is just beyond it. So again, marine debris is a big issue in itself, um, but just trying to minimize the amount of trash that's left on our beaches or finds it, our, its way to our beaches is gonna help eliminate the amount of trash that then makes it its way into our sand dunes. The picture on the right is also a good way to help out, which is cleaning up the beach. Hopefully in the near future, we can um, resume our beach cleanups at Crandon Park. We do host Eco Action Day, so once a month on Saturday mornings, we allow people to come and join us and clean the beach and receive um, certificates if volunteer hours are needed. There's also other organizations like MOVE with Frost Science Museum, and um, you're able to remove invasive vegetation, and they also do sea oat restorations as well. So overall, I hope this presentation helped you learn a little bit more about sand dunes and how they're important in preventing erosion, how they act as a buffer during storm surges, and how they provide habitat for different wildlife. I hope the next time you're headed to the beach, you take a moment to appreciate the beauty and complexity of our sand dunes here. So again, I hope you guys enjoyed. Um, just another quick poll, if you can answer, it's just three questions. So just make sure to scroll all the way to the bottom to get that third question in before you submit. So we'll wait a couple more seconds. Okay, let's see, we just go ahead and close the poll. Perfect. I hope everyone enjoyed this webinar. Um, if you have any questions, we'll be taking questions that were left in either the chat box, and I also included my email on this slide. As Anna mentioned, we do have a few more topics coming up. Um, and we do announce them every week on our social media that's listed below. All right, Crystal, thank you so much. Wonderful job. Everyone, please give a virtual round of applause to Crystal. She did a fantastic presentation for us. And since it's just about 530, if you need to leave, no problem. We are going to be staying on to answer questions from the chat. And just to remind you folks, this webinar was recorded and Crystal will be sending you a link to the recording within the next week. We hope that you'll join us next Friday, which is gonna be our last regularly scheduled conservation conversations on a Friday. Beginning in July, we will be moving to a bi-weekly format offered at one time. So every other week at one time slot. And we will announce that next Friday, as well as via email and in our social media. So you will, you all will be the first to know if you join us next week. 
please stay safe and well. And I will start giving Crystal some of the questions. Ooh, this is a great question from Fanny. Do local nurseries sell sea oats? Not to my knowledge. I'm not sure if they sell it to the general public. Um, I do know when we are given the baby sea oats to do the, the sea oat restorations, they do come from a nursery somewhere in Florida. Again, I'm not sure if it's available for the public, but I do know that there's some nurseries that do wholesale. Yeah, Crystal, I think you're right. I don't think it's a, it's that kind of a readily available species in a regular nursery. I think when Frost Science has their restoration, they're ordering from a very specific place. Yeah. I know they, they come shipped in boxes when we do our seal restoration, so I don't, I want to say it's not even local where we source ours from. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. Ooh, this is a billion dollar question from Angela. When sand is replenished, where does it come from and does it matter in terms of biodiversity? So that is a really good question. So in reference to the beach nourishments, which I'm guessing is what you're referring to, um, pretty much where is that sand being pumped from? There's two different sources that it could be from. One is um, offshore pumping. And so, for example, um, they might resort to deeper waters here in Florida, or, or sorry, in Miami-Dade, and just kind of pump them from deeper water and then deposit them on the beach. If that source has pretty much been depleted, um, sand can be shipped from other areas and they try to find a sand that has the same kind of composition. Um, for example, in comparing um, beaches here in Miami to the West Coast, the West Coast is a lot like soft sugary sand. And so they would wanna find a sand that's closer in composition and in size particles here, um, just to be as natural per se and resembling the, the beach that's being renourished. So I hope that might have answered your question. Yeah, that Angela, that's a really fantastic and complex question. And that's part of what makes beach nourishment projects so complicated and usually expensive because like Crystal said, not all, not all sand is created equal. And so they need to get the sand that's as close in grain size and texture and all of that stuff. So they can't just take sand from a quarry in Maryland and throw it onto Miami Beach. And even if they did all that transportation, it, it's all costly. Certainly. And another big thing that we have to consider here that Crystal spoke about as well is that we have a pretty active sea turtle nesting habitat in Miami. And so that sand has to be as similar as possible to the original so that it's, it's, it's optimal habitat for sea turtles. Cause if they don't like the sand, they won't nest. Or if it's too compact, you know, it might be harder for them to dig it. it, it there's a lot of factors involved in doing nourishment projects. Exactly. And Angela mentioned that she remembers Miami Beach sand projects had come from the Bahamas. Okay. Which is, I expect, highly likely. All right. Any other questions from our crowd? Wonderful. Well, guys, we want to thank Crystal again. This is her second Conservation Conversations talk of the day and her fourth in total. She did marine debris with us back at the very beginning. So let's thank her again. And we appreciate all of you spending your Friday afternoon. And we hope to see you next week. Thank you guys for tuning in. I appreciate it. And I hope everyone has a nice weekend as well. Take care, everyone. Woo!